This is Jeff Dice, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. It has been a little hiatus over the last couple of weeks, and we've done some live seminars and other things. But as promised, we are back, and we are going to work our way through next Murray Rothbard's famous treatise, Man, Economy, and State. Now, if you'll recall, a lot of you uh, joined us in reading through Human Action. A lot of people downloaded the book from our website. A lot of people purchased it from us. A lot of people just read along with the HTML and uh, got a lot of feedback that people had enjoyed that. And it's a difficult book in many ways, and it uh, was helpful to people to have sort of a support group or a weekly podcast to listen to to encourage them to get through that book, because a lot of people like the idea of human action, but it was a little bit daunting to read. So I think this book falls very squarely in that same category, for me anyway, as a non-economist. I, it was actually a little bit tougher read, as I've been through it a few times in my life. But I want to just set the stage very briefly before we introduce our guest, Patrick Newpin. Uh, Joe Salerno posits that there are four essential treatises in the Austrian tradition. So uh, we've been through three of them to date, and we've been through a lot of other great books over the last year and a half or so on the podcast. But the first of those is, of course, Karl Menger's Principles, which was the book that really founded the Austrian school. The, the next was uh, Bamberg's second volume on capital and interest, which lays out a lot of ideas about value and elaborates heavily on Menger. And the third, of course, is Mises' is Human Action. Now, I will say as an aside, there are people like Dr. Guido Holzman who uh, don't necessarily agree, agree wholly with, with Salerno's four main treatises, but for the moment, we're going to uh, we're gonna go with his program, and so we're going to get into Man, Economy, and State. And of course, you will have an opportunity to purchase this book at a discount using the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast on our site. You can get a, a beautiful uh, hardcover scholar's edition, much like our Human Action Scholar's Edition for, I, I believe, $20 with the discount. Beautiful book. And we also have a very inexpensive print version uh, that has in paperback that has little tiny print, and you can get that, I believe, for $10 with the discount. So I want to encourage you to do that. But if you go back to our series on human action, you'll recall that we started out with Dr. Sean Rittenauer from Grove City College just having sort of a fun uh, introductory podcast where we made the case for lay people to go read that. And that's what we're doing today. We are joined by Patrick Newman, who many of you know uh, as the editor of Rothbard's Progressive Era and also his uh, Conceived in Liberty, Volume 5, which was sort of a lost volume of Rothbard's historical account of colonial America. And so Patrick is a true Rothbardian. He has uh, read uh, Rothbard deeply and also studied Rothbard's personal papers and a lot of his background in history and, and personal life. So he, he's, uh, I think, the perfect person to join us today and make the case for you, uh, the intelligent layperson who wants to understand economics uh, just to improve yourself in life, uh, it should read this book. And so, Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, man, economy, and state. Wow. Uh, written between about 1952 and 59 by Murray Rothbard. Tell us, I guess, where was he in his career at the time? How did he come to write the book? Why? Uh, how did he make a living during this time? Give us a little background. So Rothbard had completed his MA at Columbia University in 1946, and he was very trained in the economics of the time period in the 1940s. And he was basically introduced to Mises and his human action in 1949, and it sort of instantly converted him to an Austrian economist, or at least a Misesian, where he was very... Uh, deeply well read in in these works, and he he, he believed in in what the Mises the arguments Mises was making, and so he was asked to write a basically a textbook of Mises's human action, uh, so sort of get, making it simpler for the average layperson uh, to understand Mises's human action because Mises assumes a lot from the reader, and he also can kind of bounce around between economics and philosophy. I mean, this is it's really like a a huge book in political economy. And so this is through the Volcker Fund, which was a very important institution in Rothbard's early uh, career. And so Rothbard was basically working on this book in the early 50s uh, through a Volcker Fund grant initially to start off as a textbook while he was also 
sort of editing his dissertation on the Panic of 1819. It's a whole different story, basically, as to why that got delayed. He got his PhD really like 10 years after he got his MA. And there's sort of an uh, interesting reason why, through no fault of his own. But he was basically working on uh, man, economy, and state while sort of finishing up his PhD. And he initially set out to basically write a simplified version of human action uh, to make it uh, very, you know, to make it easier to understand for the average reader. Yeah, and but the project morphed into something much larger than that. Yes, uh, famously, it, it obviously morphed into this huge treatise. Where early on, from about nineteen, when Rothbard really started working on the book full time, you could say in fifty two and fifty three. And he, by that time period, by the end of 53, he had worked on what you could call basically chapters one through four. So of the man, economy, and state, this is of the fundamentals of praxeology. He goes through direct exchange, supply and demand, money, and then he goes through prices and consumption, so supply and demand with money. And he was adding his own original insights in there regarding a value scale approach, criticizing indifference, uh, basically explaining a lot of Mises and sort of the older Austrians on price theory, guys like um, Karl Menger, Bamba Verk, Frank Fetter, uh, a lot of these guys. And then he started working on his chapter on production theory. And this is a very sort of standard neoclassical chapter. I actually, a couple of years ago, this was published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. I edited it and I also wrote a paper on this where he, he realized that a lot of this was wrong. And in order to do so, this he would have to sort of write a whole new production theory, some stuff that Mises really didn't talk about. And by early 1954, he decided that he was going to write this uh, huge treatise. So it wasn't just going to be a textbook. It was going to be a treatise that explained, uh, presented a lot of new information to design both for the, the layman and as well as the uh, sophisticated economic uh, economist. So give us, from your perspective, the difference between a treatise and a textbook. What's a treatise in, in econ? So a treatise is, you think of it, it's like a systematic overview of a subject. So it starts off from the basics and it sort of builds step by step. So a, a great phrase of Rothbard that he used from time to time, and I just, I just love it, is it's architectonic edifice. Right. So it's sort of this, this giant, this is a classic Rothbardian phrase. It's this giant sort of building block structure. You think of it as this building that really covers everything in it. A textbook sort of presents things in a sort of a condensed form. It obviously might have like questions or a little asides. It, it's not necessarily trying to present new economic theory, but a treatise is supposed to, in a sense, take you from the beginning to the end. And if it's written well, it's something that, you know, someone who is just sort of getting started or, or knows, you know, a decent amount about economics can learn something from as well as the actual economic uh, theorist. So it's, it's really a much more systematic overview of a given subject. And it's supposed to sort of this was really the way the profession actually initially communicated with each other. Uh, and it stopped, uh, you know, really in the 1920s and then kind of in the 1930s. Uh, but it was really back in the day. So like something like Bombavark's Capital and Interest was a treatise. Um, and, you know, then it moved into just uh, shorter books and really papers or academic journal articles. And nobody writes treatises today. No one writes treatises today. You sometimes will get books on an, like a, a, a law, like some monetary theory uh, books or other things that could cover, um, you could talk about these uh, like new ideas or really just presenting ideas that were really published in papers. Uh, but it's it's sort of different where the the new insights of economics now uh, and have, it's been this way since, you know, really Rothbard's was kind of one of the last, at least to really embrace this tradition, was you would publish your new ideas in papers. And then you might have a book later that sort of systematize, you know, just kind of all right, presents it or might just really be sort of a collection of papers or just some other ideas. But it's it's really partially the way in which the profession communicated with each other in books. In some professions, it still is like history is a book uh, culture. But a economics is not. It's it's a narrow uh, journal uh, culture, basically. So Rothbard writes this book in his mid-30s. 
Pretty uh, ambitious. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, it, it's really incredible when you think about how, I mean, he really was a one-man army in a way where he was someone who was incredibly gifted and knowledgeable about the material. And he just had an incredible ability to really just absorb and process it uh, and just present it in a way that was extremely clear. And so he was writing this uh you know, really, uh, you know, in, in his, uh, you know, exactly when when he was young in his late twenties, early thirties, he was born in about nineteen twenty six, uh, and then so he, he became thirty about nineteen fifty six. He's really, you know, writing this uh, earlier on, and it, you know, he really was a product of sort of the early fifties. So, you know, he he kind of had the basics of the book done in about nineteen fifty six. He was still kind of working on it after, but. Uh, you know, the book was sort of com officially completed in 1959. So it's someone who, you know, especially the fact that Human Action came out in 1949, and that was sort of the product of of someone who spent their entire life on economics. You know, you think of Mises' first book was in 1912, you know, you know, The Theory of Money and Credit, you know, the first significant book. Uh, you know, Rothbard was really coming out straight from the, you know, right out from the gate, so to speak. Well, I will mention that Guido Holzman considers uh, Mises' Theory of Money and Credit as one of those uh, foundational texts of the Austrian school, and I think Mises was about 30 when that was published, so a tad younger, but still. Um, you know, there were some critiques of the book, obviously, even, even within uh, free market camps. I think uh, Mario Rizzo at NYU thought it might be – that it represents sort of a rehash of, of uh, human action. So talk about – the book's reception. So, I mean, it, when it initially came out in the 1960s, it, it wasn't really well received. And that's just because the profession, you know, Rothbard was trying to sort of rescue the profession. He wasn't deliberately trying to use this sort of Austrian label uh, of saying, hey, I'm going to do something heterodox, something different. Uh, and, you know, he was trying to still sort of communicate to the profession, but it just it, it didn't really have a strong reception among mainstream economists. I mean, Mises praised it very highly. He wrote a very nice review of it. And even in other sort of uh, less well-known comments or, or remarks, I mean, he, he, he really considered Rothbard the next, the next big thing, uh, which is unfortunate because I think a significant part of the Austrian school modern day sort of views Rothbard as kind of like a splinter uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, left turn or he's kind of doing his own thing when in reality, I mean, man economy, I, I, I said this at a, a presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago. I mean, man economy, state and human action, they are complements. They're not substitutes. You know, you have to really read both of them in order to understand them. And I mean, it's unfortunate where, you know, just like human action, the, the reception wasn't good, you know, among the average uh, economist. And it's sort of, got relegated to, okay, it was just, you know, this aside thing, and it never really took off. Un extremely unfortunate. Well, what was the economics profession like in the 1950s? I mean, uh, Keynes and Marx were somewhat in the rearview mirror at that point in terms of their largest works. And so Joe Salerno, in his introduction to this scholar's edition, describes the 40s and 50s and 60s as kind of a a dead zone for economics. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, the, 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 the short answer for what was economics like in the 40s and 50s was not good, uh, where you had these these new books that um, you had something like uh, Hicks's Value in Capital, Stigler's The Theory of Price, Samuelson's Foundation of Economic Analysis, where you had these, uh, it was basically the, the, the neoclassical economics, you might say, was sort of a collection of Marshallian short-run uh, equilibrium analysis, very partial, while Raisian uh, general equilibrium, very mathematical analysis, and then the Keynesian sort of holistic uh, analysis. And this was, it was really a sea change. If you look at, say, what the profession was like from 1900 to 1920 or 1930, then you compare it to 1930 to 1950 or 1960, I mean, totally different. You know, real sort of uh, downhill uh, slide. And it was, it was very mathematical. It was very partial um, analysis where you didn't really have any of these systematic works anymore. If someone's now an agricultural economist, or I'm a labor economist. You know, Mises talks about this in Human Action, um, and you know, Rothbard in a way was trying to go back to the earlier tradition 
And unfortunately, obviously, the profession said no. <laughs> well, Rothbard mentions in the book this hyper-specialization, which I think is something that is still uh, the mainstay today. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, obviously some of the theories have changed and there's been new things that have come out since the 50s, the 40s, 50s and 60s. But, you know, the basics of the analysis, uh, the basics of, of, of really economics is it's, it's very mathematical. It's very partial. History of economic thought is more or less completely neglected. And this is an important thing where, you know, back in the day when Rothbard was learning, you would, uh, or at least right, you know, around when Rothbard started to learn, you would learn economics by going back to the great thinkers of the past. And even when Rothbard started to study economics, that was already changing, where uh, there was one time, I believe, in a, in a lecture he was speaking about, he asked one of his professors what he thought about William uh, Stanley Jevons. He said, why read Jevons? It's all in Marshall, Alfred Marshall. So you already started to see this where you would... Basically, you know, history of economic thought is is sort of like an aside. And even nowadays, it's increasingly being relegated to a minor elective that's not even required or, or not even offered uh, for both undergrad and, you know, graduate economics programs. And I mean, it, it's really, it's almost like, well, don't even learn about that. Just take more statistics and calculus courses. Well, in our new graduate program that we've created at the Mises Institute, we actually have two required courses on economic history. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the, yeah, the history of economic thought, yeah, there's two. And I mean, that's, that's very important, uh, you know, especially because one of the things Rothbard, even in the fifties, this was something he, he later described in his, uh, two volume, uh, history of economic thought, uh, works, uh, was that, you know, economics didn't begin with Adam Smith, right? So there's a whole, uh, you know, basically a tradition of economists. Many of them were proto-Austrians. Um, that, you know, that sort of got somewhat shunted or derailed by by Smith and Ricardo and those guys. Um, and so in, in many ways, you know, it's like you got to have two because even the uh, even when I taught to uh, took a history of economic thought course uh, and read, you know, the books on this that, you know, nowadays appreciate uh, economic uh, history of economic thought like Mark Plog or uh, Blaug, et cetera, is it's usually like, well, you know, you start at Adam Smith. You know, he's the comet. He comes out of, you know, and, and he was a very important economist. You absolutely have to read him. And I mean, he I mean, it, it is one of those uh, very significant works. Mises wrote uh, something, a uh, little uh, intro to like a Smith book, et cetera. But I mean, you know, there was stuff before then. And it's not like everything he did, you know, it wasn't, you know, there, there were some left turns that he took. Uh, but that's a, you know, it's a very important uh, aspect of, of Rothbard's thinking is the history of economic thought. Well, we will post to Dr. Joe Salerno's introduction to this scholar's edition because it's an HTML file. You can read it online. And I think it really will whet your appetite if you're wondering whether you want to read this book. It'll make you want to read it, which I think is the purpose of a good introduction. But Joe takes pains to point out something you alluded to earlier, which was Rothbard wasn't trying to uh, be an Austro-punk. He wasn't trying to create a new heterodox school with this book. He drew from a, from not only what we what you and I would today call an Austrian tradition, but but also sources outside of that tradition, and that uh, he was actually pretty broad-minded in the book and was and was primarily interested in sort of uh, uh, realigning economics with its methodological uh, praxeological mm -hmm. roots and, and away from the positivism that had taken taken over the profession. That was sort of an underlying goal. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, Rothbard is without a doubt, you know, the best expositor of Mises's praxeo praxeological analysis, where, you know, the idea is you start off from self-evident axioms and you deduce from them to get uh, basically realistic theories that you don't need to test or you can't even test in the real world. So this was like the very important aspect of Rothbard's work. And he was trying to... Uh, you know, see other, you know, look at other economists around that time period who were still kind of using that analysis a little bit. It might not have been consciously and in only in like some of their works. Uh, so, yeah, Rothbard was citing uh, other economists that uh, some of them that, you know, influenced him to move away from the very partial um, equilibrium analysis of the firm and instead to the capitalist entrepreneur, which is something that Austrian you know, economics really emphasizes is very important. It's that all the firms are interrelated 
and instead you just don't analyze one isolated firm, which is very prominent in a traditional microeconomics course. You look at the manager. Uh, and so there were some economists who wrote some papers in the 50s on this, uh, and Rothbard approved of them. They were great. I mean, they might not have been uh, self-conscious, you know, uh, conscious disciples of Mises, you know, using this, uh, you know, explicitly using this method, but, you know, they did have some correct analysis that Rothbard was incorporating in. So that's what he was trying to sort of bring the economics profession back to instead of the current positivist, well, one, you you just need to make things operationally meaningful or they have to be testable, or even like the Friedman, well, the assumptions don't even matter. It's all just about the predictions and and, 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 and things of that nature, which you know was something that Rothbard really strongly disagreed with. Uh, and he wrote some articles on method in the 1950s criticizing this approach. You know, and speaking of text, Samuelson was the 800-pound gorilla at the time. And Salerno mentioned Samuelson in his intro, if I recall. Mm -hmm. But he also brings up a, a quote from Samuelson, whose, whose MO was sort of like, well, you look at the data and you try to fit the theory to the data, which yeah. is opposite of praxeology in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but even Samuelson found, he sort of acknowledged or admitted that this was sometimes wholly unsatisfactory. Yeah, exactly. So this is the idea that, okay, you know, nothing is ever, you know, don't need to get into the, the, the murkiness of, of uh, you know, the, the Karl Popper and stuff like, and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, it's the idea that nothing is ever sort of truly known and you have to test it. You know, again, you have to ape the physical sciences. So we're all just, you know, the only things of economics that really matter are the things that you can sort of mimic a laboratory uh, experiment in or try and conduct a laboratory experiment. This is even goes into now uh, the, the, the current era of all the behavioral economics where they're trying to show all these flaws of the market and et cetera. And, you know, of course, they're getting these conclusions by having these extremely partial and isolated, um, uh, la you know, experiments in like these very uh, unrealistic settings. But yeah, so that was um, even sort of Paul Samuelson sort of mentioned that uh, it's, it's in a, a, on a page or two of, 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 of Dr. Salerno's introduction, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's very it's very revealing uh, quote. And it, it really shows the differences between uh, the method of, of Rothbard and Mises versus the method of, say, Samuelson and Friedman. But I just can't get away from this feeling. I'm just struck by the idea, a guy in his late 20s, early 30s, writing this treatise, the, the familiarity and depth, the familiarity with the literature and the depth of knowledge he would have to have from various sources to write this is pretty incredible. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's incredible. And then it's incredible when you, you even such, you know, working on, you know, looking through the archives, you see he was also writing other things during this time period. So he was doing uh, various reports for the Volcker Fund, reviewing books. He was working on America's Great Depression. He got a grant to do that in 56, 57. Uh, so, I mean, he, he was, it was, and obviously he had his Panic of 1819 dissertation, which is something that is easily Rothbard's most professionally acclaimed book. It's still well cited if uh, various historians are talking about the, 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 the downturn, et cetera. Yeah, and it, it really is quite incredible when you look at his, his productivity and his ability to read and sort of master uh, various fields. Uh, especially at such a young age, which is uh, it can definitely be intimidating. Uh, yeah, but but it, I mean it's it's really breathtaking when you when you look at how well uh, learned he was and how just of a great uh, and productive mind. You know, it, it must have been to to interact with him, especially during this time in the fifties when he was working on all these classic books. You know, you bring up the Volcker Fund. It's funny because if you read some of uh, progressive left fin twit, uh, you know, Janik Wasserman, who is up at the University of Alabama, wrote a, a book on the Austrian school that came out just about a year ago, Marshall Stein, my mother's, the, the Volcker Fund is viewed as some sort of ominous thing. It's kind of like the Kochs today. Like, oh, they were, they were uh, funding these right-wing ideologues to write these books and such. But, you know, and obviously there's a partisan element to that. But you know, you've mentioned to me in the past offline an interesting point, which is that this kind of deep academic work, you know, it's very difficult for someone to do if they are also a full time professor yeah. at a university with a with a teaching load. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, you know, that is a very important aspect of Rothbard's uh, career, sort of understanding his academic career, which is you have to have the right institution, you know, to provide that sort of 
support where in the 50s, he was basically just being paid to do research in various forms, you know, either living off grants or just doing work and that, you know, there's obviously everything is an opportunity cost. So if you, if you, if you got to teach, uh, especially if you got to teach students who aren't maybe uh, that interested in material, et cetera, that takes away time that you could be doing a lot of that other stuff. And that was something that Rothbard uh, definitely, um, you know, that, that, that was a blow. So yeah, the Volcker fund is basically any organization that funds any sort of free market thinking is, is treated as some sort of diabolical institution funded by the corporate fat cats. But, you know, you could have, you know, a radical Marxist institution, you know, and that's just totally fine. Or you could have the government just, uh, you know, just spending the taxpayer dollars to support all of these various sociologists and stuff. But that's, you know, that's a whole different matter. Um, but I mean, that was a that was an issue. I mean, that basically sort of collapsed in the early 60s. And then that he finally sort of fit, hit that in the late 60s when he uh, basically stopped working on what became Conceived in Liberty. He had a grant, about a four year grant for that. And so then he kind of had to go into academia. So, I mean, it's an important aspect that when you look at Rothbard's career, um, Dr. Salerno and I were talking about this. I mean, it's really you have sort of uh, the network of scholars, the institutions that can provide funding and other resources, and obviously the creative genius, which, you know, which Rothbard had. But, you know, you really you really need all three to kind of really take, you know, to really produce uh, significant work and you know, take take yourself to the next level, so to speak. Yeah. But I like to think about the person, too. I mean, let's be honest, his time with the Volcker Fund, his time at Brooklyn Polytech, he didn't have a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that that even shows at that time. I mean, like the the biggest thing I would say, at least, is that the the Volcker Fund and other places provided him time. Certainly, the money aspect was something. You know, he wasn't he wasn't living large, so to speak. Uh, unlike you know various other academics at the time or or, or later academics. I mean, Brooklyn Polytech was not uh a, you know a, a great school. He had tried to apply to various uh you know top level jobs in the Northeast, et cetera. In the late fifties, early sixties, but they, you know, turned him down. He even, you know, even in like the history profession, et cetera, given a lot of the work that he was doing, and so it, you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, even something like Mises at NYU, you know, New York University is a fantastic university now. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not quite an Ivy League, but it's definitely, uh, cl- you know, up there. You know, back in the fifties, it was not the school that it was. It became later on in the in the seventies and especially eighties and nineties. Uh, where, you know, it, it wasn't, um, you know, Mises was teaching business school students. Uh, it wasn't sort of prestigious, uh, you know, it's known now. So, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it's an unfortunate sort of uh, picture of the state of Austrian economics around that time period. Well, I don't think Murray Rothbard and his wife, Joey, were ever really sort of middle class comfortable until he made it to UNLV. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, I think that's a, a correct assessment. I mean, I know uh, he was working, you know, he had various, uh, you know, re- book grants or you know, contracts, etc. Um, but I mean, in terms of having that, I mean, he he was he lived in a you know rent controlled apartment, I believe, you know, and it was, it was it was very large, so it could keep his his voluminous library. Uh, but you know, it, it wasn't a uh, like the you know, if you would think for someone, if you never knew Rothbard. And you only saw his works and you sort of imagine with the situation he was in uh, and then, you know, his, his you know, his, his teaching position, his 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 his, his book contracts or, you know, um, the money he made, et cetera. It'd be different than what he actually had. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate because you think, oh, wow, this this great mind, uh, you know, and then he's working at, you know, Brooklyn Polytech and, you know, he's publishing these books with, you know, not like the top publishers of the time. Well, a couple of years ago at our 35th anniversary in New York City, I, I remember I, I mentioned I held in my hand a, a stapled, uh, printed out copy of his bibliography. And of course, it was it was dozens of full length books, hundreds of academic articles, thousands of popular articles, millions of words. I mean, it was it was pretty daunting. And I think, again, Guido Halsman says, you know, there are some people who may have read every word Mises wrote or close to it, but he doesn't think there's anybody who, who's read every word Rothbard wrote or close to it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a good uh, good description. I guess the, there would only be one person that was Rothbard, but that doesn't really count. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, he 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 he, tr- he produced a tremendous amount. And what is perhaps the most 
uh, just uh, literally mind blowing aspect about this. And it's something that I think, you know, I, you know, I always try and emphasize this because the average person today wouldn't really know about this, especially a young person, such as myself. I mean, he did this all before the Internet. He did this all before a word processor. He used a typewriter. So, you know, nowadays when you write something, I do this. I mean, you go through multiple drafts, you edit things, you know, you cut out entire things, you know, you, you're just constantly revising and, and it's a lot easier to do, do so. I mean, just technologically, you can literally just type it in. But I mean, he's doing everything with a typewriter. And the fact that he's able to do that, I mean, he edited his works and, you know, he had uh, multiple drafts and stuff. But the fact that he's, you know, able to do that using like the typewriter and he's able to produce you know, paragraphs and, and papers and books and chapters and all the stuff that like really flow well, you know, I mean, it was like it was in the mind and then it just kind of, you know, just sort of, tra you know, uh, translated uh, in, in, into just this, you know, very beautiful prose. So, it, I mean, yeah, it's something that really needs to be appreciated, especially when you're trying to understand how scholars operated, uh, you know, before the Internet in the, in, you know, the late 90s when it really became a thing. Yeah, and to uh, access a source and have a footnote in an article, you had to have that physical paper or book yeah. mm -hmm. to access. You know, Lou Rockwell has a great story about being in Murray Rothbard's apartment in New York City one night late. Of course, uh, Murray and Joey were night owls, stayed up, and there were cigarettes. And, of course, mm -hmm. there were, I think, you know, he, he liked vodka and some other drinks. Uh, but Lou mentioned something to him one night. You know, Lou said he was always getting tired and ready to go to bed, and he just couldn't keep up with Murray, uh, despite Murray being older. And he said one night he mentioned to Murray, oh, you know, I'm looking forward to, uh, to that conference next week. And Murray said, what are you talking about? And Lou said, remember this, this you know, conference X that's coming up? And Murray said, oh, my gosh, I had forgotten about it. So he goes into his uh, office little area with the typewriter, and, you know, one, two in the morning, uh, lights a cigarette, sits down and proceeds to bang out, uh, you know, a 10 page article complete with footnotes and everything like over the next couple hours while Lou's nodding off somewhere. So mm -hmm. I think that's it's, a, you know, just his uh, his sheer the, a prolific writer. I mean, doesn't even begin to describe it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, he, I've, I've heard similar stories regarding that, you know, regarding other papers, et cetera. And what makes it more incredible is the fact that I mean, he doesn't. He just wasn't an economist. Like he, he's more than an economist. Uh, he was also an economic historian. He was also a historian. He did political science. He did. I mean, you could have you. You could just publish only. You know, just look at only his popular articles. So, and, and that would be a very you know uh, you know it was a good career. You know, it might have not been in like uh, in, in, in always in, in, in like great. Uh, you know, publications and stuff, but it was still, you know, you just very prolific. You look at all the stuff he was talking about, foreign events, elections, um, you know, just all sorts of things. And then, oh, yeah, there was also I think David Gordon once said that, you know, you might think there was actually like five Rothbards somehow, like all living in the same apartment or something. They're all just working the division of labor. It's like, all right, Rothbard one, you know, works on economics. Rothbard two is history. Rothbard three is political science, et cetera. You know, but there was actually only one. And yeah, I mean, it really is. Um, for something like that, I mean, you do need that, obviously, that creative genius aspect. I mean, it's similar to, you know, you look at something like athletes. So like a Michael Jordan, um, you know, is someone, it's, you know, how, how do you, how do you be like Michael Jordan? Well, if you, if you have to ask how to be like Michael Jordan, then you can't be like Michael Jordan, you know, and, and it's, it's similar where, you know, how do you be like Murray Rothbard? Well, <laughs> if you're asking about that. Uh, you know, how to do all that, then like, you know, it's like you either, you either got it or you don't got it kind of. And it's wow. just certain aspect, you know, certain characteristics people have that really are able to just set them apart from the rest. But you can imagine if, a, if an economist today tried to write a history of colonial America, they'd be savage. They'd be told to stay in their lane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in 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 that would that's what would happen. I mean, one, unfortunately, the 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 colonial America or even American history now is in a totally um, different state uh, than what it was in the past. Uh, and you know, it's a whole whole different podcast for that. But yeah, I'd be told. I mean, and even Rothbard had the same thing: is oh, just stick to your profession, et cetera. But you know, no one else was really working on that stuff. So that's why Rothbard said he you know he wanted to do it, and he had. You know, he had insights. He had things he wanted to talk about. So he obviously put his pen to the paper and he was uh, he was working on that. And he 
he just displayed a tremendous amount of knowledge. And, you know, it, it's uh, even if you just look at like, oh, you just published a five volume uh, or four, but he wrote five volume, can, you know, history of early America. Uh, and then that's it. It's like, all right, well, wow, that's great. I mean, that's worthy of a Wikipedia page, basically. And that's like, no, that was a side thing, kind of. Well, in Human Action, Mises has a section uh, right after his section on full socialism, what that would look like. Uh, he has a section called the Hampered Market Economy. Now, Rothbard uh, elaborates on this section in his own section of Man Economy State called Power and Market, which appears at the end of the book. Uh, it starts out basically with a punch to the face. I mean, the, the opening section of, that, of, of that, that part of the book is called Defense Services on the Free Market, which is a radical concept, a radical statement in the 1950s. People weren't talking like that. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the background between the power market section, uh, how his original publisher objected to it in, in part, and, and as a result... It was published separately until the Mises Institute sort of integrated it once again. Yeah. So the, you know, Rothbard initially, there was really, you can think of it, there's three parts of of, of um, the uh, the book. You know, you got the man, you got the economy and you got the state. And the part three was him going through government intervention and just sort of demolishing the idea that one, you know, not using, uh, using value-free analysis. He wasn't bringing in his own you know, uh, oh, should or, you know, the, the, et cetera. I mean, he was just showing how economists can show governments more inefficient than markets, et cetera. And so he had this where he wanted to sort of have this very systematic overview of intervention. And this is something that Mises didn't really have because obviously he was a minarchist. And so a certain level of taxation, a certain level of government spending, you know, you need to have the police, you need to have the courts, you need to have all of that provided by, you know, the coercive agency of the state, um, you know, that was necessary. So you didn't have, well, not all taxation is bad because some taxation you need. Uh, some taxation doesn't interfere with the market. You know, you could have like, a, I guess this was described, you know, a neutral tax. And Rothbard shows that that's not the case. And, you know, he, he first talks about obviously defense services in the free market. This was something that he later elaborated on and works, you know, on anarcho-capitalism you know, and for new liberty, et cetera. And then he goes through, you know, the three types of intervention. I mean, he shows how taxation is intervention. It's a coercive exchange uh, or it's a coerced transfer. And uh, I mean, it's really, uh, you know, much different. And, and so what happened was um, this guy named Frank Meyer, so who was a libertarian, but it was, you know, in the 50s. And this was also a, you know, libertarian of, you know, the Soviets are the bad guys. You know, you need, you know, this is how many libertarians were. And this is really, or they might not have called themselves actually libertarians, but that's the side note. This is one of the main reasons why Rothbard split away from the right in the 50s was because they had a you know, very aggressive foreign policy. And uh, Frank Meyer basically advised uh, when Rothbard was working for the Volcker Fund and, you know, they were helping him trying to find a publisher, et cetera. And he was trying to get a publisher who says, well, you got to cut that. Uh, and you got to condense it down into about a, you know, about a chapter, which later became chapter 12. And obviously Rothbard was not too happy about that uh, because Myers said that, well, you, you're you adding your own, uh, you know, political analysis and it's not just the pure economics. And, you know, Rothbard said that, no, actually, you know, I'm trying to just show how economic analysis can describe these things. And so then that later got published as Power and Market, which is a great book. I mean, standalone, it's obviously included and if you are daunted by, you know, man, economy, and state, you can always start with that because, you know, it goes through some of the basics of the market and then it just, you know, demolishes government intervention. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was an unfortunate thing uh, that, you know, instead man, economy, and state, I think that might have possibly had some effect on its in, its impact that, you know, sort of one of the main punchlines of the book didn't get published in 62. So that, you know, obviously that that kind of hurt it in a sense. What do you think about how this book is organized relative to how human actions organized? So there are, I guess there's two types of people. And the, 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 the first group says that human action is, you know, you could say better organized than man, economy, state, or, and then the, op, the, the other group says the opposite. I'm of the latter group. I think this book is much more well organized, especially from the perspective of economics. So it really, you know, Mises Obviously, Human Action is a phenomenal book. It's it's uh, 
it's unparalleled. It, it, you know, he assumes a lot on the reader. So, and especially because he's, you know, oh, look at my other works or like if he talks about price theory and he's like, oh yeah, see this uh, book by Bomba Verk. I mean, you know, it's, it's in German and you're like, okay, well that, that could be a little bit of a dead end for a lot, a lot of people. You know, Rothbard really develops everything step by step. You know, he, he you know, uh, not like holds the reader's hands, but, you know, he walks you through, he's building that architectonic edifice, so to speak. Uh, and I, I think it's, I think it's much, uh, I think it's organized in a much more clear fashion. You know, he starts off with the basics, then he looks at the individual, the man, talks about, you know, the basics of markets, then he goes through production theory, then he covers monopoly and money, then he goes through government intervention. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's really well organized. Well, what strikes me also is that although this book came out a little more than a decade after Human Action, 1962 versus 1949, it was in large part written just a few years after Human Action came out in the early to mid-50s by Rothbard, obviously having already read Human Action. Uh, but, but stylistically, the tone, I mean, Mises is a man of old Europe, born in the 1800s, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, Rothbard is decidedly an American, born in the 1920s in sort of uh, uh, Jewish Brooklyn. Yeah. And I, I mean, there is a real difference in, in the feel of these two books, despite being pretty close together temporally. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you, you can definitely uh, see that. And especially, I mean, just also from you know, the, the age difference uh, of the two writers. Um, you know, one of them's much younger, the other one's older. And yeah, I mean, there there is a different, uh, you know, feel and sort of style to it. I think that sometimes has misled people into thinking that Rothbard was doing something different than Mises, when in reality, like the successor of human action is man economy and state. Uh, in that, you know, they 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 really uh, work uh, work well together. And you know, you see how actually Rothbard sort of building on a lot of stuff Mises is using and in inciting Mises and et cetera. But yeah, I mean, they, they come from different perspectives. Human action was the product of a long career, uh, you know, publishing, you know, great works, you know, socialism, theory, money, and credit, you know, stuff on method, et cetera. I mean, it even was in a sense a product of another book that came out, uh, National Economy, that really didn't go anywhere because of World War II. Uh, whereas this was written a couple years later and, you know, one of the things Mises doesn't really do in human action, he doesn't really cite that much literature. If you look at the footnotes and you compare them to a man economy and state, you know, Mises has footnotes, but sometimes like they don't even have, you know, citations, et cetera. So, you know, he's really kind of using a literature, especially from the 20s and the early 30s. Uh, and Rothbard in many ways was citing, at least when he was writing this in the early 50s, early mid 50s, like, the most up-to-date literature. I mean, he kind of mastered that uh, that field. Well, Patrick, last question. Make the case for us why a, a interested layperson should read this book, should tackle it. Well, I think it's the best book I've ever read. I started reading it when I was in high school and finished it when I was early in college. And I think it's something that really, if you want to understand economics in a systematic way, it's a book that you will... Uh, really benefit from, and you will continue to go back to. So it's definitely a challenge, but that's, you know, challenges are not without rewards. And it's something that, you know, if you want something different than a traditional textbook or some sort of popular book, you really want a systematic analytical book that really, you know, explains the essential points and sort of describes the, you know, the logical analysis of the market and of government uh, look no further. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to work our way through this book, Man, Economy, and State, all 1,200-odd pages over the next coming weeks. Every Friday, there'll be a new Human Action podcast. We encourage you to read along, to read ahead, to, to tackle this book. Uh, we will provide with today's show some links to where you can purchase it, where you can read it in a beautiful searchable HTML format for free. If you prefer to just read it on your machine where you can download it to your Kindle or other device and using the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast in our store, you're going to be able to get a discount if you'd like to buy this beautiful scholar's edition, uh, either in hardcover or tiny, tiny, tiny little softcover phone book style. Uh, I'm not an economist. 
I was fortunate enough to be introduced to Rothbard in the early 1990s because I had a friend going to UNLV. So I was able to meet him once, uh, you know, and I will fully admit that this is this is a bit of a tough read for people who are an economist. Unlike uh, human action, it's got some equations and some graphs and some the occasional numbers. But for the most part, uh, like anything else, like going to the gym or eating your broccoli, you'll benefit from uh, things that are not always so easy. So that said, ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Dr. Patrick Newman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me on. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.